Good afternoon and welcome to UK Column Live. I'm Brian Gerrish and I'm going to be interviewing Victoria Ash this afternoon. Uh, Vic Victoria, Vicky, uh, is an SRA survivor. She's an, a survivor of satanic ritual abuse and she's kindly agreed to come on uh, a live Skype link to tell her story. What we'd like to achieve together this afternoon is to give people an introduction to SRA what is it? It's real. People are suffering as a result of it. And through hearing some, some of uh, Vicky's story, for people to be able to realise that this is a very real problem in the UK. And of course, to do something about it, we need to understand it and recognise it. So let's introduce Vicky. Uh, we should have you. We, uh, we got communications a few minutes ago. Are you there? I am. Excellent. I am. Okay. Hello, Brian. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And um, Vicky, really, it's an open book. We're here to give you the opportunity to <coughs> speak out on the subject. I think it would be nice if you just started off and uh, sort of introduce yourself and told, told the viewers and listeners a little bit about yourself. And then you're very welcome to go where you think, well, really, where you think you should take people to understand more about SRA. So, okay. I'm Victoria Ash, uh, I like to be known as Vicky. I am married with three children. Um, I live in Saddleworth. Uh, I am now a Christian and um, I run a ministry in helping people come out of abuse. Um, and I have been campaigning to expose satanic ritual abuse uh, for the last 26 years. Um, I first went to the police uh, in the early 1990s, Geoffrey Dickens was my MP at the time in Saddleworth and he helped me and encouraged me to go to the police. Um, but at the time the case was closed uh, because they said that there was contaminated evidence. Uh, I also went on uh, Panorama with Geoffrey Dickens in the 1990s to expose satanic ritual abuse and as we now see in the media there is a missing dossier of Jeffrey Dickens um, where he named perpetrators of satanic ritual abuse. Over the years, I've just been getting on with my life, uh, running a business. Uh, I'm a beauty therapist in Saddleworth. Um, I've been raising my children, just getting on with life, but also endeavoring to come to terms with my own past. Um, it's been a long haul to actually come through um, to freedom as a survivor because it takes time to face the memories that you've had as a child that you block out, the trauma that you've suffered as a child. Um, but now I can honestly say that I did seek help from church. I'd gone to various therapists, had different counselling but I did seek help at church and I can honestly say that today um, I am free. I don't have any fear of speaking out as a Christian. I believe that the victory is ours. I don't have any fear of speaking out about satanic ritual abuse. And I think that the whole reason that it is, the occult means hidden. And the whole reason that it is um, hidden is because people have fear to actually speak out about it. But now that I am a Christian, I recognize that, you know, you walk in faith and not fear and we have the victory. And if I can help one person who it's happened to to come forward um, and prevent it happening to other children, I believe the climate now is right for it to be exposed. We're seeing historical abuse cases um, in the media. We see the Jimmy Savile. Everything I've talked about for the last 26 years is now in the public arena. And I believe now is the time to actually name it for what it is and do something about it. And it's only when we come together, um, you know, in numbers and in unity that the strength, the strength in numbers. Right. And that's why I believe it's right to to talk about it, even though it's not a palatable subject and not an easy subject for people who don't understand to hear about it. And I understand it's very, very sensitive for people who don't understand. But nevertheless, it is the truth and the truth needs to be exposed. 
Right. Vicky, um, you've already raised so many interesting things there. If I may, just on a bit of background, because, of course, many people have read about Jeffrey Dickens in the paper. This was the man that took the dossier. That dossier gets lost. You were able to meet him. How old, how, how old were you when you met him and what's, what sort of man was he? Wonderful man. A uh, very brave man. Um, it was early 1990s, so I would have been in my early 20s, probably 26, 27. I'm 51 now. So <laughs> if we do our maths. It's, it, I, was, I was in my 20s. Wonderful man, very supportive, because the, the main problem with any victim is being believed. When you've gone through the trauma that we suffer, uh, why would you even begin to want to talk about it and tell anybody when you're not believed? But Jeffrey had experience of this. Um, I, I was linked to Diane Corr from Child Watch, whose counsellors supported me, and they also came across other, you know, girls. I can't go into my situation for legal reasons but everything linked together um, from other SRA survivors, what had happened to me. And uh, Jeffrey was very, very supportive. Right. And I'm very grateful for all that he did when he was alive. Th thank you for telling, telling us that. I'm just going to stay on this, this point just for a few moments because, of course, the BBC in particular has gone to great efforts to discredit Jeffrey Dickinson. There were some pretty appalling articles written. Um, one of the attacks on him is that he was a bit of a buffoon, a bit of a party man. He didn't really understand what he was talking about. You're now telling us that you went to see him uh, with your, your own case when you were in your mid-20s, so you are an adult going to him. And, and you're also saying at the time you spoke to him, he'd clearly got other people uh, coming to him. Have you any idea of how many uh, cases he was aware of at, the, no. at the time? No, no, he never, you know, obviously there's confidentiality, so he never discussed any other cases with me. Um, but he was very, because even in those days, to talk about sexual abuse was was not a subject he discussed. So, you know, he was very brave. And even, I mean, I, I remember in those days people said what's a pedo pedo what's a, they couldn't even say the name pedophile so we're going back in a in a time when even sexual abuse was very very difficult to to talk about um and i felt that he was very brave because he did openly and he was right <laughs> everybody now knows that sexual abuse um is a very common problem Right. OK. Well, this this, of course, starts to put some foundation uh, to the subject, because, as I said, he, he was he has been treated very badly in the press. He's, he's not around to answer for himself. And uh, somebody who you're saying has done uh, tried uh, his very best to help uh, yes. then ridiculed. And we know this is this is part of the pattern when people try to do something about this subject. Mm -hmm. So. If we and also, can I add, Brian, that yeah. I have actually asked um, Panorama for the, in for the actual video of the interview I did with him in, uh, on Panorama and nobody seems to be able to get it for me. And I find that quite interesting because I'd like to be able to see the interview I did. Um, I can talk a little bit about that interview if you'd like. I was asked to go they said that it the actual panorama interview i went on they said that it was to help social workers deal um they were getting a bad press uh, for satanic ritual abuse and that this particular program was to help them deal um uh with the issue and then I, I obviously they came and filmed me and then I got a phone call warning me that the program wasn't, it was deceptive and it wasn't actually to help the social workers at all. It was saying that satanic ritual abuse wasn't true. So I then phoned up uh, the BBC and I asked not to be put on the program because I said, you've, you've lied to me and, and said that you're trying to help uh, satanic ritual abuse to be exposed. I said, I found out that uh, you're not. But they still put me on the programme. 
And even more than that, the victims that were interviewed before me were blacked out. And I've never, I'm, I'm glad now that I've never been blacked out on anything. I mean, I, I've spoken on, on various programs. I'm glad that I've never been blacked out to this day because I am not afraid. Um, I'm not ashamed either because, uh, you know, there's no, you know, I was a child. There's nothing to be ashamed of. So I'm glad that uh, I haven't been blacked out in that sense. But even so, when I asked Panorama not to put me on the programme, they still did. And they didn't black me out. <laughs> well, Vicky, uh, I have, have to say from my personal experience, not a subject as serious as yours, but I discovered that the, the BBC duplicitous in the way that they, they dealt with people. So I was asked on one particular subject, the subject was common purpose, you know, to give them evidence. Uh, they wouldn't come and see me, they hadn't got the time. And then when I did give them evidence, they, uh, they didn't invite me on their programme, but they had the opposing side, common purpose, invited on live. I was just um, denigrated in the background. So devious behaviour. Um, mm. Can you remember the name of the uh, producer or the director for that Panorama programme? I'm sure, Ma I think Martin Bashir, uh, you know, I think Martin Bashir was the producer. In fact, I'm sure because I, I rang up and asked to speak to him. Right. And uh, I think we can also say it was interesting, of course, that the BBC originally uh, were definitely going to do a report on the Holly Gregg abuse case up in Scotland. They'd spent time with uh, Holly and her mother. And then all of a sudden the programme was completely cut and uh, they made excuses which weren't justifiable. Well, that's a very interesting background. Can you start us off somewhere? Many people simply refuse to believe that SRA exists. I've said over the last few weeks, isn't it interesting that the British government back in, um, I think it was about 2007, um, said that um, Satanism was an approved religion in inverted commas for use on board British warships. And the BBC was very quick to report that. So if people say, well, Satanism doesn't exist, I simply say, well, you need to have a word with uh, the government and the head of the military Absolutely. and the BBC. But what can you tell us about this subject to start people off who may feel that this cannot possibly be real? Satanism is a religion. And um, now as a Christian, I recognise the Bible to be true, that uh, everything you see in the Old Testament... Um, as we say, it's the same God yesterday, today and forever. It's the same enemy yesterday, today and forever. And the same things, the same practices that went on in the Old Testament, perversion, child sacrifice, idolatry still goes on today. Um, they have a, a calendar, um, uh, dates where they perform uh, rituals as a worship to the devil. They dress up in cloaks. Um, as a child, I was drugged. Um, they use hypnosis um, and mind control so that wherever you've been, they take you out to secret locations late at night where they do the rituals, which is their worship um, to the enemy. And, you know, we see missing children, children going missing today. There are so many, you know, parallels uh, of unanswered questions for people and I think this is where the occult means hidden that these are unanswered questions but as I, I've been journeying through to understand what my childhood was about to understand why did people dress up why did these things happen to me um, not only the truth of me facing my own memories as a child but the truth of the Bible is um, that Satan exists. And that's the greatest deception that the devil does, is that he doesn't exist. So that um, all the bad things that happen, uh, he goes on killing, stealing and destroying lives, being the liar that he is, so that the God who truly loves us gets the blame and our faith is destroyed. And I see over the, uh, over the years as I've faced the truth, um, exactly i didn't understand that it was satanism that was happening to me 
I didn't understand the, I was sexually abused by my perpetrators. I was burnt, uh, which I now know is branding in Satanism. So all the symptoms I had as a child, you're just, it, it's all you've known as a child. But now I recognize what that was all about. And the fact that they dressed up, um, it's a religion. Um, Vicky, for, for people who have never gone near this subject, I, I can just add there, of course, if you simply Google Satanism and you Google the Satanic calendar, uh, you can come up with some very informative sites uh, about this and the things that Vicky's started to mention. But a Satanic calendar talking about particular important days for Satanists and the fact that on those days um, a variety of rituals are carried out, which... Uh, which may be fairly minor, or they may involve sexual practices or, the, or, or sacrifices of animals or indeed humans. So that information is there on the internet. And I probably should just add, um, this is the sort of thing that you really need to know why you want to go looking at this material. It's not something for just idle curiosity. And of course, this, this discussion uh, this afternoon is, is a very serious one. So those practices are there. Should we perhaps also add, Vicky, that, of course, in satanic terms, uh, the devil is the bringer of light. Uh, he is the one who's actually supposed to be looking after us, uh, informing us, bringing us to knowledge. So there's an inversion in the belief system. Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Right. So can you start us... Um, somewhere with what what actually happened to you as as a child and how old were you? Um, I was very young. Um, it started off as normal sexual abuse, um, but then the memories that I have were being burnt. Where I I I can talk about it now because I'm 26 years on. Believe me, if you saw me on the Panorama interview, I did. I'm a different person today because I, I have faced the truth and it set me free. I'm a totally different person than I was being interviewed with Jeffrey Dickens on Panorama. Um, so it, it's, it's, very, it, it's difficult to talk about it, but I don't get as upset now as I used to because obviously I've been campaigning for a long time. I was burnt, uh, made to bend in front of the fire and uh, poked with a, a poker from the fire on my bottom. Uh, and I remember being burnt as a child and, and never understood why. And now I understand that, Satan, uh, that branding is a part of Satanism. I was uh, sexually abused, um, sodomized, uh, oral sex, um, I was involved in pornography as a child, photographs taken of me, and they used to uh, say that I was the star of the show and they would say that this was a game and I was the star of the show even though I didn't like the games that they played. Um, they would drug me because I would remember waking up um, many mornings and I would just see daddy long legs all over my wallpaper. And I, and I remember thinking, why would I just see daddy long legs all over my wallpaper without a gap in between? And I now know that that's the after effect of hallucinogenic drugs. Um, there was so much secrecy uh, around my whole childhood. There were trigger words that um, would be said to me that would, would I now know was hypnosis, where I always had to keep the secret. And um, funnily enough, uh, uh, I went on a Radio 4 programme that Dennis Wrigley, the leader of the, uh, the co-founder of the, the Maranatha community, um, asked me to go on. And I spoke about satanic ritual abuse on Radio 4. And after the interview, somebody from the BBC rang me because I left my name. I thought there's no point publicly speaking out about it and then not telling people who you are because how can people ever be helped if you, if you don't leave your name? And somebody from the BBC rang me and said, um, I believe that I'm involved in something because I keep waking up in the morning and all my feet are dirty and they're scratched and uh, as if I've been through the woods, but I don't even know where I've been. 
and he wouldn't leave his name. But this is typical of Satanism is, you know, we're seeing programs now on television about hypnosis. You know, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, television shows showing hypnosis and people doing absolutely daft things on stage. And then they don't remember a thing about it afterwards. And it's the same thing within Satanism that keeps the mind control so that people don't have any memory of where they've been, but the perpetrators know exactly um, who comes to the meetings. Vicky, just, um, just, if I can just take you back a little bit. Um, when you're talking about this happening to you as a child, how old would you have been? Four, three, four. Right. And so what, at what age, um, what age did you start to have some awareness as, you, as you're growing older as a child? Presumably at some point you started to be able to put some of the pieces is together yeah. in your head to... You, you might not have understood it all, but you started to have an understanding. How old would you have been then? I always had flashbacks. I always had dreadful dreams, uh, um, but couldn't piece the jigsaw together. And it was really at the birth of my first son um, when I was 25 and I had my first son. That was when the flashbacks and the triggers came in just horrendous because the, to protect my own son I think that's a mother's instinct to protect her own child and that was when I started to seek help in in piecing it all together. Right you you've already said some things which I I instantly picked up on because my my very very limited experience of this subject has simply come about from um uh, trying to help and trying to get the truth out about um, the, the um, family courts and children who've been abused in care uh, and in speaking mainly with mothers but some fathers as well and speaking to some of the children in some of the cases that, have, uh, that I've dealt with um, there has been hints of this type of abuse going on. Now, something I've picked up on very strongly is you use the expression star of the show. You were told mm. that you were star of the show. Mm. And this is, this is the exact expression uh, which the two uh, youngsters, the boy and the girl from the Hampstead uh, abuse case used. They said that there, there was another girl in particular in the, ring, in the group of children who were being abused. She did seem to enjoy what she was asked to do. And as a result, they were always telling her that she was the star of the show. And mm. I think they also added that that uh, little girl got extra sweets, which was part of the reward mm. system. Well, and I... Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, Brian. Yeah. And I just, just added this one and then we'll, we'll come back to you. And um, the other one was um, uh, the daughter of a particular mother, where the daughter was complaining about a family member giving her busy drinks, which she said I didn't particularly like. But then she was talking about remembering being in rooms with, with um, uh, the, where the walls were painted particularly different colours. And she remembers men standing around her. But it was all odd. It was, I don't know whether I dreamt it or it was my imagination. Um, so those are the sort of glimpses that I've had personally from, from mainly mothers, as I say, who've come forward where their children were being abused. And then within the, the abuse story, this extra level uh, um, started to come to the surface. So sorry, I interrupted you there. Yes, no, I'm sorry I interrupted you. It, it reminded me of when I was about 10 um, winning a fancy dress competition um, and I went as Lady Godiva. I was encouraged to go as Lady Godiva with just my knickers on and walk around the room and I, I got a huge chocolate bar, <laughs> Big Capri's chocolate bar as a reward. So everything, you were rewarded um, for doing what they wanted you to do. Right. And so that leads us to a particular point. Now, I know you've got limitations because of uh, pending um, court cases, um, but use, using general descriptions, who was they? Who were these people that were around you and were carrying out this sort of abuse? Within a coven, um, a coven is, is 
usually th about th I think it's 13 members you will have the reason that it's covered up is because you will have within a coven a policeman a gynecologist a doctor a lawyer all you know people that are able to to cover it up and um, that's been my experience of trying to expose satanic ritual abuses I know that some people who are involved will endeavour to prevent the truth of satanic ritual abuse to be exposed, whereas others are just not equipped to deal with it because it's not yet within their remit. They've no protocols to guide them, as there's not currently anything on the statute books to help them, um, you know, deal with the subject. And therefore, uh, I think that uh, there needs to be training. I'm sure there is behind the scenes. There's probably training going on for the police because there must be many victims now with the historical abuse cases coming forward. I'm sure that a lot of those cases will be SRA. And some of the police just, as you say, just won't even believe that it goes on. Um, key point there, you've talked about within a co coven there being professionals and this is yeah. this, I think, is one of the sticking points for many people. They they always imagine that if if you're talking about the abuse of children and and you're talking about dark satanic stuff, it's got to be rather odd, weird people involved. When the truth is, I think, rather different that um, you've got people from all sections of society, but you've particularly got people from the professions. Absolutely. And as, as I have, obviously, as I have spoken out over the years, I have been threatened. I've been threatened by doctors. I've been threatened by gynecologists. I've been threatened by solicitors. I have been threatened by um, top psychiatrists. So I know if I'm not talking about anything <laughs> that's got any substance, there would be absolutely no reason for people to try and silence me. Because if, if it's not true and you've got nothing to say, then why should people be afraid of you speaking? But there are certainly a lot of people that are afraid of satanic ritual abuse being exposed because um, they may not even, some people may not even want to be part of it. But that's the problem with Satanism. It's the grooming that goes on within Satanism that you get lured in. And, uh, you know, you might have... have been invited to a meeting and then you've witnessed some you know you've suddenly a ritual's happening and you've witnessed something and then you're enslaved to it because nobody's going to believe you if you go so it, it's a whole grooming process of being lured into satanism therefore i think there will be many many people who would love to have the courage to tell the truth but they simply it's it's <laughs> It's far too difficult. People's jobs get threatened. Um, you know, their life gets threatened. I know uh, what it's cost me over yes. the years uh, um, to, to speak out. I'm very grateful that I've stood the course. I'm very grateful uh, and privileged to be sat talking to you today because I could have ended up in a mental home. <laughs> Well, Vicky, um, it's wonderful to uh, see you on screen. I'm, see I'm watching you on screen, <laughs> obviously, and to see you so bright and, and bouncy talking about this very unpleasant subject. And Thank I'm you. sure you're right that, of course, the more people who come forward, the more people will come forward. And, and um, I want to encourage people that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I want to encourage people that there, there is hope and that people can get better. You know, when you say that you never, ever recover, you can recover. And I, I want people to, to know that you can and, uh, and to encourage people that, you know, but I also believe that prevention's better than cure. It's not all about the therapy afterwards. We need to expose satanic ritual abuse so that it's preventing it happening in the first place. Yes. I'll, I'll just bring in, while, while it's come into my mind, that, of course, um, one of the um, more recent cases where there is a satanic abuse element in the background is Melanie Shaw from, from yes. Nottingham. Yes. And, of course, uh, many, many people who know about the subject would say that one of the reasons that she has had such horrific treatment from the uh, local authorities, that's across the board, the police, 
um, the local council's uh, social services, or of course took her child away, was that her, her abuse was not, you used the phrase at the beginning, sort of normal child abuse. There was also this uh, very d dark satanic element with it. Um, Vicky, when you were a child, still a child, did you try and speak out then? And if you, and, and if you did that, what happened? What, what uh, reaction did you get? <laughs> because so many people were involved, it wouldn't have mattered who I spoke to because there would have been involvement there. Um, one of the phrases that my perpetrator used very regularly was that uh, if I ever told, um, I would be in trouble with the police and that I was special and that what was happening to me was special and therefore, you know, uh, uh, you don't want things to ever get any worse than they already are. I cannot, I cannot begin to tell you the fear attached to speaking out about what's happening to you. I, I, you know, even now, I didn't even think I would be nervous, particularly for the interview after so many years. But to recall the actual grip of fear to silence you, uh, only somebody who's come through it can can ever um explain what that's like yeah vicky one of, one of the other people i was privileged to speak to on this subject was um, an elderly lady who was up in the cumbria area she'd been working for many years with several other ladies trying to rescue um, girls in particular from satanic occults uh, from satanic, satanic cults and um, she was one of the first people that started to talk to me and that was from her personal experience of um, trying to get the, the girls out of the cults. These were girls that were uh, being used in the same way you're describing, but they were also breeding babies, which were then being used for satanic practices. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the things that that lady said to me. She said, it is so difficult to get um, the people who are suffering over the, the thing of fear Mm. And she said that they had one girl in particular that they'd spent many months um, supporting and encouraging and helping. And she wanted, that girl wanted to get out of the particular coven. Um, but, but on the last night or two nights before they were going to actually get her and obviously completely move her from, from that area of the country, she was effectively going to be moved into a new identity that was the last they heard from her. So they don't know whether there was a exactly. leak or something came out. But this is what the lady described is the fear of people. Can I say that I actually believe that because I have been so open over the years and exposed it, I actually believe that that's protected me even more <laughs> because I've never hidden it from from meeting Jeffrey in the early 1990s, from people where I live, seeing how poorly I was and where I am today, the fact that I have been so open, the fact that I've, I've never, I, I believe, has helped me to get well and also given me the support that I've needed. And I have even more support now than ever because people actually come up to me and say, Vicky, everything that you've been saying is now here. You know, <laughs> you know, people are more are talking about it more than we actually think while we're sat here. They're actually wanting something to be done. People are waiting for something to be done. Yes. And I believe it will be done. I believe that now this is the time, as I said before, to deal with satanic ritual abuse. And as I told the police, whether they ever listened to me or they didn't, one day they're going to have to listen because it will come out. I certainly agree with that. And I think we have seen an amazing um, step forward, particularly over the last year. Obviously, the, the information that's been coming into the, to the public domain and mainstream press, as they say, has made a big difference. Um, but you can almost feel it that it's gone from being totally suppressed and hidden to the fact that people are starting to talk about it. And everyone who speaks about it, there's somebody else Mm -hmm. uh, coming forward to, for, to add their bit. Mm -hmm. So as a child, 
you're trapped in fear. You can't actually speak to people everywhere you turn. You don't know whether there's another person who's involved with the cult. Exactly. That's uh, the thing. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. Now, you said, I think you, you were 25 when your son was born. That's when things started to change for you. What, what, what happened then? The protection for my own child initially and um, the need to, to... I remember when I had him thinking, how on earth can I raise this child when I'm still a child myself? <laughs> the reality that I was fragmented and that's what happens within... Um, some, within the trauma of satanic ritual abuse is that, you know, where they've called it multiple person, personality disorder in the past, now they call it dissociative identity disorder, you've split off. There's, there's fragmented parts um, where you're still a child in some ways in order to cope. And, and I knew that I needed, I knew I was running. I had so many symptoms, uh, addictions, eating disorder, drinking heavily. I had so many issues that were just symptoms of the abuse. Once I started to deal with what I was running from, the symptoms, uh, I don't have those symptoms today. I don't need to drink. I don't need to escape. I don't have an eating disorder. I don't. And that to me it, it is clear that the truth sets you free because I've actually dealt with you know, the root, you see, so many people just want to deal with the symptoms uh, of things instead of going to the root. And the root was that I was satanically ritually abused as a child. And once I, I faced the truth, and, and as traumatic as that was, it was a relief. I can't explain that even to face the memories at times, I thought, thank goodness I don't have to carry that around. Thank goodness I don't have to carry that secret around with me anymore. And... Um, I even went to my perpetrators and apologised that I told. I just said, I just want to get well. <laughs> I remember early on and then I thought, what on earth are you doing, Vicky? Apologising that you've told. But I was just so desperate to be a decent mother to my own children that I knew that I needed to get well. Right. So, so you were able to produce a change in yourself, which helped you move forward. Yes. And then when... When was it that you, what, what was the reaction once you started to talk as an adult? Um, you got help from Jeffrey Dickens. Were there other people giving you help? What, what about all of the charities and the children's charities that say mm. they're there to help? As I say, Diane Corr was a very key factor in helping me. And Dennis Wrigley, I mentioned, the leader of Maranatha, um, he supported me. And as we, you know, as we know, African ministers come over here to our country to warn the church that witchcraft is very open in their country. But here it's dressed in suits and overalls. So even when I started going to church, African ministers knew what was wrong with me, the way I would react to the word sin within church, the way um, going up for communion would trigger me. All these, the fear of God that I had. I had a tremendous fear of God that I was going to be punished because I remember they used to all crowd, they, they crowded round me with the cloaks on and you can't see people's faces, you see. When, the, when it's dark and the cloaks are over you, do you, see, do you see the deception where you can't see who's underneath the cloak? The faces are hidden. But I would hear the word, she sinned, she sinned, punish her, punish her, punish her, she sinned. Well, if you can imagine as a small child, people crowding around you in the dark saying that, she sinned, she sinned, punish her, punish her. As soon as I found myself in a church and I heard the word sin, people would see me hiding under the pews because that was a trigger word. And, you know, I want to praise God that African ministers and various ministers who, did, who have obviously an understanding of witchcraft knew what was wrong with me and they were they helped me to to spiritually get free because that's what it is it's a spiritual problem it's not it's it can't be dealt with this is you know it's no point hiding the fact that the bible's true jesus came to destroy the works of the devil and how do you deal with witchcraft you know it's jesus who deals with witchcraft and i had deliverance ministry um, and healing. And that's why I'm where I am today. And I just continue to tell the truth of how I've got through it. Um, 
Vicky, this is, a, of course, this is the key area w with this. What is going on is a spiritual battle. That's something Absolutely. that I, I to Absolutely. totally believe in. And um, uh, in, in the, all the troubles we see around us today, uh, there comes a point where to, to get a solution for that, we've, we, we have to get back on looking um, at matters through spiritual eyes and working in that way. So I'm, I'm totally on board with you over that. It's very interesting that you talk about African min ministers. This is something, again, I've heard, I've heard of before. There was um, a few years ago um, an African minister that had come down to Plymouth and he gave um, a series of talks and, and conducted ministry in some of the Plymouth churches. But that was part of his story uh, of being absolutely astonished to see shops full of things that he directly equated Absolutely. as witchcraft symbology and witchcraft yes. items. Yes. And he, he, he was uh, amazed that in this so-called educated country, people had so little understanding of things that they were bringing into their homes. Absolutely. Or, or, or indeed office spaces. Um, yes. So that was a very, very interesting man. I'm going to say that um, when I initially approached churches to try and get them to understand some of the, uh, the more political things that were happening in the country, um, I got rejected by churches um, more than any other, um, any other places, which I found very interesting. There were individuals who um, gave me support and were interested to hear what I was talking about. But my overall recollection of going for help amongst the Christian churches certainly in my local area, were um, a rather arrogant dismissal. And um, what, what was your, you, you've talked about African ministers, and I take from that that you've had special support from them. But yeah. what, what, what about the reaction from the established church, the Church of England, for example? I, I think they're learning. I think, I think the church is waking up <laughs> to the reality of spiritual warfare, and, and it needs to, but... Yes, I think some ministers struggled uh, with me, but I, do, I definitely think that there, there is a change coming where people, where vicars and ministers are understanding because that is, that's the ministry of the gospel, is deliverance is part of the ministry that Jesus indeed cast out demons and people that, that, that uh, were oppressed and in bondage. And um, I... I I found it very hard at first. I, I would say going back to first going to church, especially when I'd had no understanding of Christianity at all, I couldn't understand why people were afraid. <laughs> so that that made me even more afraid because I thought, well, if your God's bigger than than <laughs> the God I grew up with, then how come you're afraid? So I would encourage Christians to really know the power of the gospel and that the victories won at Calvary and to really uh, read the word of God and, and know who they are in Christ because I, I met a lot of Christians that were very, very afraid and, and still are, but they are waking up to the reality of spiritual warfare. Okay, I'm going to come, come back on to that in, in a minute, if I may. Just following through um, the progress, so you eventually are telling your story as an adult and um, you've been able to re-engage the police. Now, I know you're going to be very limited in what you could say at this, but how were you able to get the police to re-engage in your particular case when before it had been totally closed down? It's difficult to answer that one um, because of what the perpetrators were actually planning to do. Um, as I say, the the issues, because people know I've spoken out, it tends to come to me rather than me going to it. And somebody posted me a newspaper article through my door. And because of this step that um, the perpetrators were making, I was able to go back to the police and say, you know, you really need to listen um, because if you don't close this door, there is a serious problem. But because of legal reasons, I can't discuss what that was. Right. Um, just, OK, I understand that. I won't take you anywhere that's, that's, that's difficult. I just, just to say, um, previously you've said one of the great difficulties is that when you talk to the police or other people, you don't know who may be a Satanist themselves. 
Yeah. You obviously had the courage to go back to the police, more or less saying to them, you need to do something. How did you get over that hurdle that there could still be policemen who could get involved in, in the investigation, who could, who could be Satanists? How did you get around that hurdle? I think because... Uh, I, and I need to be totally truthful about my journey. It was an African lady. I've shared this with the police myself. An African lady came up to me in church and said, you need to do what God's told you. To, you need to go back 20 years and do what God's told you to do. And I remember at the time thinking, oh, for goodness sake, have I got to go back and deal with something in my childhood again? Yeah. And I recognized at that time that 20 years previously was when I'd first gone to the police. And so I can only share my journey that I stepped out because I believe God called me to step out and because I know he's called me to step out that's why I'm not afraid because I know he's with me um, and I did go back to the police and as I say each door that he's told me to walk through has opened and they are being educated even as we sp speak I believe that the police are being educated in this area and uh, and equipped and i will always like to think there are more good men than bad men <laughs> so oh. let's not see everybody as a satanist either i think i think we have to get the balance so that there's no scaremongering and you know that everybody you see is a satanist i will still believe that um yes evil only prospers when good men do nothing but there are still a lot of good men and i want to encourage the police that work very hard and are trying to do something about it. I want to encourage them to carry on because I believe that breakthrough will come. Um, Vicky, just fantastic what you're saying. And while you, you're talking and I'm thinking about the police, uh, a couple of years ago, I was invited to uh, um, a private meeting in one of the committee rooms up in Westminster. And there, there were several police present at the meeting. And I think it was a policeman and a policewoman um, gave a description of, of how they investigated and brought to trial and secured convictions on the satanic abuse amongst a family in South Wales. And um, I think they were very brave police and uh, they talked about the difficulties they'd encountered in the case, uh, but also said that once they really understood what was going on and what the children had gone through, they weren't going to let it drop. There was also a retired police lady in that room who talked about with a colleague going around every police district in UK, and I think there's about 43 of them, um, in order to find out about child abuse. And then she was describing how when they produced a report that there was abuse on a much, much greater scale yes. than they'd realised, their report was simply shut down. And as she said, it disappeared into the safe of my mm. boss and never saw the light of, uh, of day Absolutely. again. So these good policemen and women are out there. And I'd yes. also and like- they need encouraging. They need encouraging. We've <laughs> yes. also had another one uh, that uh, Mike Robinson and I sat with a few weeks ago talking about uh, investigations into child abuse in London, uh, uh, what the particular police officer had done, and then the fact that senior police and indeed politicians had worked with some of the top charities, uh, I won't mention names of those, but some of the top children's charities to shut down the investigations into mm. the abuse of children. So you've gone through on faith that that is, the, that is the thing that allows you to open doors and shed some of the fear. Yes. Um, I'm afraid I can't remember the exact title of it, but and we've, we've hammered the BBC a bit quite rightly. But I believe on YouTube, there's a BBC documentary about witchcraft from the mid uh, 1970s, uh, which I've watched a, cu a couple of times. And uh, that's not a bad place for people to start. The reason I bring in uh, the reason I bring it in now is that towards the end, a lady who has escaped from a coven, uh, much as yourself, uh, says, well, of course, the thing people need to know is that the Satanists are very frightened of people who are not frightened of them. And also prayer has an immense power and Huge. that Satanists, Absolutely. Yes. Satanists are very, very frightened of prayer. 
Um, Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. <laughs> right. And that, that is something that uh, the, a lot of the national press scoffs at when people yeah. start to talk about how you counter some of these very powerful and dark forces. Of course, if we, if we, measure, if we mention proper faith, of, of course, this is, uh, this is met with great scorn uh, because it's, it's actually frightening the opposition. And also it's about revelation. You know, I, I've, I've had more revelation over the years as I've, as I've walked with the Lord. So, you know, you can't, you can't expect people to be where they're not. <laughs> We're all on a journey and, um, you know, it, it, it is part of the journey that people, people will eventually, it, you know, it, it will be brought out into the open and people will understand. And it is horrendous, but we almost see now People are anaesthetised to evil, you know, oh, another murder, oh, another rape, oh, another, you know, we, people's hearts are becoming hardened and that's, that's in scripture, in Hebrews, they're being, becoming hardened and it's it even, you know, hardened by sin's deceitfulness and it even says in, in the Gospels, doesn't it, that because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold and we're actually living in those days. So, you know, it is a matter of deception being exposed, and that's exactly what's happening. That's, deception is being exposed as we speak. Uh, that's brilliant, Vicky. Just one question. In your experience of Satanism, um, were you given any indication or did you get any feel for sort of how big the satanic culture is across this country? This is one of the things that a lot of people, of course, get very frightened. They think if they step outside the door, uh, is that person a Satanist? Can you give us any idea of what we're talking about as, as say, a percentage of people who might be involved in this? I think it is. It's, I think it's very, very big. But I think that it is growing because it's allowed to grow because it's not exposed. And I, I, I come back to the point that I said about grooming, about recruiting people into Satanism. I mean, we see, I wanted to come back to that point earlier on. We see the increase of the occult on the television. We see, um, you know, as, as you mentioned about African ministers, voodoo dolls are being sold in, in shopping malls. Um, you know, holistic, I'm a beauty therapist and we see that through holistic therapies, Eastern religion practices are coming through into beauty therapy and it's time the church should lead the world, not the world lead the church. The church needs to be a voice <laughs> so that people don't walk into, you know, my people die through lack of knowledge and people are walking through doors that they don't even know that they shouldn't be walking through. And um, this is where... People need to be taught because how do you know if nobody ever informs you? And, you know, when you talk, which I find astonishing is when you discuss the Ouija board, if you actually say to somebody, oh, have you ever used the Ouija board? People go, oh, no, no, no. So they know that witchcraft's real because of the Ouija board. And yet when you actually talk about satanic ritual abuse, they find it hard to believe. And yet everybody watches ghosts programs and there's more, you know, there's far more occult films now than there ever used to be. And our children, which is Satan's assignment, our children are being anaesthetized to evil. And we're living in the days where, where it says, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. And we are living in those days. And I believe that Satanism can only grow as long as it's not exposed. But it is our job to expose it. And again, give people an opportunity who don't really want to be involved. I know there are people that, as, you, as you've said, they're involved and they don't even want to be involved. But there's nowhere to go to be able to come out. And the church needs to welcome those people to come out and, and to help them and to restore them and to, to set them free. Uh, Vicky, I was going to ask you what we did about this, and you've you've summed that up in in oh. such a no no is is Good. perfect because Good. you've just <laughs> run straight into the fact that as as we learn about this and know about it, we have to do something about it and and speaking out. So you've you've covered the point of of uh, not only must we do something, but how we do it. I'm going to say I think you've brought us to a, a fantastic conclusion. I would like to ask for another opportunity to talk to you because I, I have so many questions, things I've been writing while you've been talking to me. 
I think there's a lot more that we could uh, discuss, and in, perhaps in doing that, um, this would uh, this would help the process of bringing other people to the fore. Um, so we can talk separately on that. But I'm going to say thank you very much for having the courage to come on live and uh, tell us about yourself and your experiences as a, an SRA survivor. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me. And it's been a privilege to be on your programme. And I, I just thank you that you are speaking out. Um, bless you. Thank you. Well, I can only do that, Vicky, with the support of a lot of other people. So that's the good side. OK, thank well, you. thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, that was um, Vicky Ash with us talking about uh, SRA. And uh, I'm sure that we're going to be having further uh, programmes on this very, very important subject. Thank you for joining us. Bye bye.